We don't have too much time left. I, I wanted to finish up um, looking a little bit in the future. Uh, the first actinium studies are open now. Uh, there's an actinium HK2-directed radioligand therapy. Several PSMA-directed actinium studies will be launching probably in early 2024. There are already phase one uh, actinium studies that are, are open and accruing in other countries. How do you see the introduction of uh, the alphas in other than the bone-directed therapy of radium uh, into the tumor-directed realm? What, what are your expectations, your concerns, and your level of uh, excitement on these? Um, Tanya, why don't you start us off? I think they're very exciting. Um, they'll have a different efficacy and toxicity profile, uh, so we will need to learn about it, but um, we're fortunate to be participating in the HK2 Octinium, and uh, these are definitely active, and um, not only exploring the new particles, but different targets, I think, is um, a fruitful landscape for further investigation. Raina, how about yourself? I completely agree. You know, I think um, there's a lot of excitement around alpha emitters, which tend to be more potent, shorter diameter of cell kill. So I think the toxicity profile is going to be a little bit different with an alpha particle. And it's not just, you know, whether it's alpha or beta, there's also, you know, small molecule inhibitor or, you know, link, being linked to a small molecule versus being linked to a monoclonal antibody. So there's a lot of actually really exciting agents that are in development that I think you know, hopefully we'll be able to improve upon what has been done already with Vision and PSMA4. How about yourself, Evan? I'm very enthusiastic about the alpha emitters. Uh, like what Raina said, I think, you know, one of the things is, is that alpha will induce double-strand DNA breaks and could induce more potent cell kill. That said, you know, there is a little early experience that's been done of alpha after beta, and although there's anti-tumor efficacy, there's also a lot more xerostomia. And uh, that could be a challenge, and that's what where, where Raina was bringing up the issue with, you know, do you link it to a monoclonal antibody where it's going to be a larger molecule, might not penetrate as much into the salivary glands, might not cause as much renal tubular necrosis, but might cause more myelosuppression, right, versus a small molecule that's going to get more into those areas. So I think that all has to be worked out. Maybe there might be thought of using targeted alpha radiotherapy earlier in disease states since, you know, you might get run into these problems with xerostomia later on. But, uh, you know, there is one other potentially limiting factor is I think, especially with actinium, I think there's a limited world supply. And mm -hmm. I think there's only one production facility. So we have to be mindful. And I think that production facility has to be mindful of who they collaborate with. And, uh -huh. you know, so I... I Just think that the field is, <clears throat> is dealing with that yeah. in terms of shifting attention to lead 212, which a generator is about the size of a large suitcase and um, sits in your own institution. Uh, but I think the world acknowledges that the actinium supply is going to limit what we can study and the number of agents uh, and hopefully the number of patients that, that, that could be treated. But I do think that that spurs, uh, that limitation uh, is spurring a lot of innovation and uh, expansion into other um, radio ligands as the payload. Yeah. I think fortunately that supply is right up the street from my office, uh -huh. Everett, <laughs> Everett, Washington. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You know, I think that the really sweet spot that we look forward to with the alphas is the potential for addressing micrometastatic disease because of the physics of the alpha particle being able to pluck off individual cells at a time. And in terms of the antibodies, I, I just raised the issue of uh, the Scott Tagawa trial of um, actinium J591, which actually never hit a DLT hematologically. So frequently what we conceive of in our minds as the limitation of antibodies, we shouldn't let interfere with our actually doing the trials and getting the data because we can be wrong under those expectations. And indeed, if you look at most trials, we are wrong, right? So sometimes we're wrong in the, in the negative way and sometimes we're wrong in the positive way. And I think that the Tagawa trials have shown that you know our expectations were 
actually wrong and it's less hematologically toxic than anyone would have uh, imagined before. I guess we'll end up with a sort of round robin of what you're looking forward to in the field of radioligand therapy, whether that's from a clinical perspective or a study perspective. Uh, Raina, what, what are you looking forward to seeing in the next uh, year or so in the field? Yeah, I think there's gonna be other radioligands that do the same thing, and I think we're gonna have to figure out how they fit into the picture with SPLASH and I think Eclipse uh, study. Um, I think thinking about what are the right combinations, what are the right sequences, I think that's gonna all need to be fleshed out um, in the design of future studies, so it's exciting. How about you, Evan? Yeah, I think we need to put more effort into understanding mechanisms of resistance to design the next set of studies and agents that we should be going towards next or combine ra rational combinations etc. Um, I think there's opportunity to do more biologic exploration mm -hmm. or just all the work on that. And Tanya? Yeah, I think combinations are going to be crucial. We know with tumor heterogeneity, which is so um, predominant in prostate cancer, targeting one antigen has its limits. And so rational combinations, such as with immunotherapy to um, engage the immune system to maybe access what's not being accessed by a PSMA-targeted agent. Um, that and other combinations will be really exciting. And I should say that there is another registration trial that is fully accrued in terms of Plovicto, which is PSMA addition. So I think that we'd all be interested in seeing in the castration-sensitive space uh, what the potential is. And there, what Reina was saying in terms of uh, do we need so much treatment in that patient population, I think that that will help answer that, that question. It sounds to me like there's a lot of work that's, that everyone's looking forward to in terms of both the optimization side of the coin and figuring out the resistance side of the coin. And being able to then choose your regimen for an individual patient most likely to benefit from that regimen is really what we have uh, to look forward to. I think there should be a very exciting set of years coming up. There are a lot of really good trials just on the verge of opening in 2024 that will be really exciting. And I think we'll expand the repertoire for our patients for an active therapy that ultimately I think will be to the patient's benefit, giving them new treatment options uh, to live longer and live better, which I think is what we all want for them and why we all do the work that we do. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time uh, for this really interesting discussion on radioligand therapy and uh, thank the audience for your time and for your attention. <laughs>